that. Okay, we're about to go live now. Okay, and we are live. And now we are live, although I think um, we have some work to do here. We've lost to Mexico. Ah, we're back. Now, yeah, sorry, some uh, some technical uh, trickiness at the start of this one. My apologies. Um, so, <laughs> welcome <laughs> to April to the, the I think probably our first official pandemic. Uh, um, and uh, we are. Uh, joined, thankfully, um, from Mexico by Melina Gastelum, um, who will be presenting the April um, ENSO seminar. And we have uh, one or two live participants um, along as well. So um, it is, I'm so very happy that um, Melina was able to, to join us, um, although our, the, um, the, the heavy load of the internet is making this a somewhat less reliable um, connection than it would ordinarily be. Uh, I think we will sort of push on for the moment and hope that things straighten themselves out a little bit. Um, okay. There we go. Yeah. So we have we're we're losing the the picture just a a little bit intermittently, um, but hopefully, as I said, it will uh, will stabilize. Um, and I think once we get going, uh, we'll have. The slides will provide us some stability, I think, as much as anything else. Um, so I first um, I, uh, got to see you present at a, a workshop in San Sebastian in Spain last summer, Melina, um, and really enjoyed uh, the the presentation and the just the I think you're raising some really important issues actually um, about the issues of of scale and particularly about the issues of dynamism and time and the role of temporality in in how um, affordances, structure, behavior, structure, at different scales. Um, and this is, I, I understand this is all coming out of your, your PhD work, is that right? Yeah, it's a product of my PhD thesis, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess with that we have, I'm just looking now, we have a um, our usual sort of quick check as to whether or not, I think we are um, fully live, we're, Got a few people um, engaged on on the stream, um, and I guess without further ado, I'll um, I'll invite you maybe to start the presentation while our uh, connection is good and solid. Um, so I invite you to uh, Melina to to share your screen and okay and get the April Insel seminar. Okay, I'm sharing. Are you seeing it? Um, not just yet. If you um, give me a moment. Yes, I think it's it's uh, it's coming up now. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Although I think we're seeing your edit window. Yeah, so that should be clear. I I just put it in whole presentation. Are you seeing the the scale matters slide? The first one. I'm. I think I'm at a bit of a delay, but it seems to be um, sharing pretty well. It's sharing your whole screen, so we're seeing all your slides at once, sort of. Ah, okay. Let me. It's not in present mode. Now. Let me to Alt Tab to uh, to the, the presentation mode.
still seeing the yeah, slides. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let me see. Now? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So um, thank you very much, Marek, for this invitation. I'm really happy to be part of the ENSO seminars. Uh, and of course, it's a strange time. So um, we have to mention that uh, at some point, although it, this is uh, a kind of, of breathe to concentrate on something else in the things we do. So I hope uh, whoever sees this that enjoys it. Um, and as Mark said, this is a presentation of my PhD thesis, one of the products that I hope come onwards. And this is actually under review in the special issue that uh, Marek, uh, Ezekiel, and Tony and Manuel are editing. Um, and I'm very happy to be participating in it. Um, and well, the the title of of this talk is scale matters temporality of the perception of affordances and well what i want to to do in this talk um, is to explain uh, how i seek to unify an active and ecological approaches to cognitive science by emphasizing the fact that both approaches view cognitive processes as being inherently temporarily extended. My claim is that characterizing the temporal scales in which perception of affordances occur, they will serve different purposes of explanation within the theories of radical embodied cognitive science. Um, specifically, I want to bring together, on the one hand, Camaro's 2009 dynamicist understanding of affordances, which he called affordances 2.0, with, on the other hand, a distinction originally made by Varela in 1999 and later taken up by Sean Gallagher between three different timescales for understanding cognition, which is the elementary, the integrative, and the narrative. And I will go into all of these things um, step by step. Um, so, um, there are at least three points of agreement, I think, between an activism and ecological psychology. Uh, first, they share a, conce a, a conception of perception that makes it continuous with action. So for an activist, perception is understood as something we do. And in order to preserve our form of life, as Di Paolo and Alba Noe and Elena Escrivano have noticed, while for ecological psychology, Perception occurs in terms of invitations to act, and it is an achievement of the individual, not an appearance in the theater of his consciousness. Um, second, for both approaches, the environment is constitutive of cognition. For an activist, the, the environment is a constitutive element of adaptive interactions, which are essential to sense making and to maintain a central ten tension that gives autonomy to a living system. <clears throat> this autonomy emerges from a primordial tension, which refers to those dynamics by which the identity of an organism requires to persist while opening itself to the environment and making sense of it at the same time. Meanwhile, ecological psychology makes the organism environment system as a unit of analysis of cognition as a whole. In other words, ecological psychology explains the way in which agents perceive information about affordances and relates to them. So for both approaches, cognition doesn't happen inside the head, but in the interaction of an organism with its environment. And third, both the cognitive and the ecological psychology definitions of environment coincide in that the surroundings are primarily meaningful for the agent in an embodied, non-semantic, non-representational sense. 
So the idea of sense making in an activism shows that the world is meaningful and constitutive in as much as it allows the organism to perform a certain action that is relevant for its autonomy, which is close to the ecological idea of affordance. That is, the things are perceived meaningfully as they call for action. Uh, and therefore, the unit of analysis is the animal environmental system as a couple unity. So in this talk, um, the hypothesis is that by saying that the environment is constitutive of cognition and adding that by understanding how the scales of temporality of the processes by which the engagement with it occurs, that is the perception of affordances, we can step forward in bringing together these two approaches. So for this, I will claim that the conception of affordances 2.0 has to be taken seriously and further explained as a bridge between them. This will involve taking the temporal dimension of abilities in affordances seriously, particularly in terms of interaction across multiple temporal scales. So for this, I think that perception of affordances should be characterized in terms of dynamical agent environment systems with abilities and aspects of the environment understood as constraints on the, uh, on the potential trajectories of such systems. So <clears throat> I will just briefly uh, talk about affordances 2.0. Just I, I know many, many people have treated them, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to expand a lot here. Um, but it's important to say that in the ecological psychology tradition, there are at least three important assumptions at its basis. That perception is direct, that perception is for action, and that perception is of affordances. And not all conception of affordances are compatible with the idea of bringing together ecological psychology and an activism. So, for example, conceiving affordances as dispositional properties might seem like reducing cognitive agents engagement with the world to an almost mechanical response which directly contradicts the inactive conception of, se of sense making. So I believe that in line with Bax and Camero, uh, their paper in 2018, that this conception of affordances as dispositions describes one of the various possible levels of analysis of the agent environment engagement, namely the total set of skills shared by agents with a common biological organization, a common niche and a common pattern of behavior, while the inactive approach describes a different level, namely the individual one. So as Camero rightly notes, um, ecological psychologists usually define affordances statically in this way of dispositions. So consequently, as an attempt to dynamize the concept of affordances, he introduced the concept of affordances 2.0, which we have ex the exact quotation here. So affordances are relations between abilities to perceive and act and features of the environment. Affordances and abilities are not just defined in terms of one another, as in the dispositional and relational views, but causally interact in real time and are causally dependent on one another. <clears throat> this reconceptualization of affordances is explicitly formulated to make the natural, but, but largely unmade, connections between ecological psychology and an activist movement in cognitive science. Um, so the key point is to conceptualize affordances as interacting in real time, as dynamically, dynamically coupling with the rest of the environment and among them. Um, Silverstein and Chemero in 2011 expanded on this, saying that the animal's endogenous system has an endogenous dynamics that generates and constitute the sensory motor abilities and the whole nervous system. <clears throat> uh, the sensory motor abilities are coupled with a specific niche, which in turn modulates the dynamics of the nervous system. So affordances and abilities are not just defined in terms of one another, but causally interact in real time and are causally dependent on one another in a non-linear fashion. And here we have the Tony Chamero schemes of 2009. Um, so affordances 2.0 are compatible with an active idea that agents actively make sense of their environment in terms of how it affects them, 
But the question is, how does it happen and in which temporal scales? So another important conception that I will use in this talk is the difference between physical world, habitat, and umbelt that uh, Bax and Chamero in 2018 recently developed. Um, they use the distinction to clarify disagreements between ecological psychology and an activist also, as well as to clarify certain, certain tensions within the former re in relation to the conceptualization of affordances. So um, Gibson had made a crucial distinction between the physical world and the environment of animals. He said that the physical world exists in all spatial and temporal scales, from nanoseconds to nanometers to millennia and galaxies. The animal's environment is limited to the behavioral middle scale. So for humans, the spatial, the spatial scale of the environment is from millimeters to kilometers, and the temporal scales are from hundreds of milliseconds to years. Gibson also pointed that the environment of animals is perceived in terms of ecological events and not in terms of time. Time is actually an abstraction made by humans. Ecological events have been characterized then as changes in the layout of affordances of the animal environmental system. Uh, notably, the physical world is inherently meaningless, but the environment is not because it contains affordances. Furthermore, <clears throat> Banks and Camero argue that it is necessary to subdivide what Gibson referred to as the environment. And they say that we need to make a finer distinction between one, the environment as a set of resources for a typical or ideal member of a species, which they call the habitat, and two, the environment as a meaningful life surroundings of a living of a given individual, which they call the it is useful to think about information about affordances for perception as something that exists and can be described according to the potentialities of an agent. So in the habitat, uh, we will have information about affordances that can be thought of as a property of the, of the habitat, and the information for can be conceived as a property of the umwelt. Um, this distinction between physical world, habitat, and umwelt allows for distinguishing the individual's set of affordances, given its biological setup, its development, and her history, which is the umwelt, from the general objective set of affordances that are possible for a group of individuals of a species, the habitat, and those could be seen as dispositions or potential affordances. In other words, there are affordances that exist objectively for an individual as a member of a species or of a group of individuals, and some affordances that are perceived as soliciting for a given individual, given its histories and interactions within a particular niche and that become actualized and thus form part of their ever-changing umbelt. So the question is, how can we characterize the temporally extended character of perception of affordances? And here we will adopt Husserl's analysis of the intrinsic temporal structure of experience that can be applied not just to experience, experience consciousness, but also to embodied action. So thinking about perception based on coordinated motions radically changed the way the agent is related to the environment. And as we said, Gibson noticed, the perception of affordances seem to have a this distinctive temporal quality as well. The feeling of past, present, and future are merged, or more exactly, the activity of perception is acknowledged to be retrospective and prospective. So in other words, the concept of affordances makes reference both to the agent past abilities as well as to the future possibilities. So intrinsic temporality in affordances, um, we can understand it uh, with, the, with Husserl's analysis of the intrinsic temporal structure of experience which can apply not just to consciousness, but also to embodied action. 
Uh, Bertos in 2003, for example, suggested that the Husserlian analysis of the retentional protentional structure of experience is a model that also works for processes involved in motor control. <clears throat> so intrinsic temporality can be found in the dynamics of bodily movement and action and manifest itself at both the subpersonal and the personal levels of analysis. This intrinsic temporality is not objective time that can be measured by a clock, although action certainly does take place in time. And intrinsic temporality is something we can find in all the dynamics of bodily movement and action and manifests itself at both the subpersonal and the personal level of analysis, which we will explain further on. <clears throat> so the Husserl's model called the Pratsensate um, is represented in this figure. And he applied this model to the conscious perception of a melody. But we will claim that it can be applied to perception in general. It has three structural aspects. The horizontal line ABC represents a temporal object, such as a melody of several notes. The vertical line lines represent abstract momentary phases of an enduring act of consciousness. And each phase is structured by three functions. The primal impressions, allowing for the consciousness of an object, a musical note, for example, that is simultaneous with the current phase of consciousness. Retention, R, which retains previous phases of consciousness and their intentional content, and protention, P, which anticipates experience, which is about to happen. It is important to say that one could think that Husserl saw consciousness as an internal metaphysical entity. But I think this is a misreading because we, we have to consider this, and I quote, uh, consciousness is only as long as it is open to the world. Therefore, there is no in interiority or exteriority. There is only one intentional fabric that is indissolubly, that of consciousness and the world. In this phenomenological tradition, this amounts to say that consciousness is the experience, the pure experience that happens in the perception of the world. Um, Husserl argued that to do phenomenology properly, that is to attend to the experience themselves, leaving all preconceptions aside, one has to bracket questions about the world beyond experiences. But then he is talking about a pre-given world as an objective scientific phenomena. So this experience, the umbelt, of course, cannot be bracketed. What is bracket are the judgments and reflections about the world. So we are talking about the same experience, the umbelt, that is going to be temporarily structured in this present state. I don't know if it's pronounced like that, I'm sorry. Um, in other words, for Husserl, there can only be experience in the sense just explained, because there is an intrinsic temporal structure that supports it which he called the present. So, so summarizing Husserl's claim and flow have their origin in the retentional and protentional structure of temporal extended experience consciousness, and it is the relations between the retention, primal impression, and protention, which constitute the temporality of the flow of experience. So in terms of affordances, to perceive affordances is to experience affordances. There is not a division in the perceiving experiencing. All perception implies an experience that is itself dynamical and will include different temporal scales in its performance, as we will see in the next section. Uh, putting it bluntly, perception experiences of affordances also have a temporal flow that originates in this rib structure. It's rib because it's retention, primal impression, protention. Um, so, a number of theorists have proposed to capture these subpersonal processes that would instantiate this Husserlian structure shown in, in the figure below before by using a dynamical systems approach. Uh, Thomson, Van Gelder, and Varela. And on this view, action and our consciousness experience of action arise through the concurrent participation of distributed regions of the brain and their sensory motor embodiment, which are established in three scales. The first two, which are said to be directly relevant to protentional-retentional 
processes. So these time scales are divided in the first one, which is the elementary scale, which is the, it's called the one scale because it varies between 10 and 100 milliseconds and it's um, applied to intrinsic cellular rhythms. Then the second is the integration scale, the one scale varying from 0.5 to 3 seconds, neuronal processes. Sorry, I said in the, in the one before it's one, uh, one tenth scale. And the third one is a narrative scale involving memory, the 10 scale, which uh, is for more than three seconds. Sorry about the typo there. So, um, we, uh, to account for processes, an activist appeal for, to the ideas of a dynamical system and diachronic constitution. Brain, body and environment are said to be dynamically coupled in a way that forms a system and the, comp the coupling is not equivalent to identify of material parts. Rather, it involves physical relational processes. Significant changes in one part of the system will cause changes or adjustments in other parts. For the inactivist, just these dynamical causal relations constitute the system because these processes occur on several timescales. It is helpful to introduce this threefold distinction in temporal and dynamical registers. It is important, it is important to note as, as well, as Beaton emphasized in 2013, uh, th uh, sorry, when Barella says neural mechanisms in the threefold uh, explanation he gives, he means it. He supposes that it is the ongoings on the, in the brain that will directly correspond to the details of attention disclosed via phenomenology. And here we want to claim that these three temporal scales are all intertwined within the environmental constitutional situation, the diachronical one that we just described, that is involved in the particular embodied perception experience of affordances. In other words, in the integration and in the narrative scale, the neuronal sensory motor processes are diachronically constituted by the dynamically coupled brain, body, and environment system. And this happens through the perception of affordances. So, sorry. Um, going back to the scale, is the basic time scale of neurophysiology. It corresponds to the intrinsic cellular rhythms of neuronal discharges roughly within the range of 10 milliseconds, the rhythms of bursting interneurons, to 100 milliseconds, which is the duration of an inhibitor of postsynaptic neurons. Um, where processes are integrated and of cell assays. Phenomena, <coughs> the integral comes to the experience living present, the level of three constituted cognitive action. It corresponds to basic action, reaching or writing. On a dynamical systems interpretation, neuronal level events on the elementary scale synchronize by phase locking and form aggregates that manifest themselves as incompressible but complete acts on the integrative scale. And the narrative scale, three seconds or more, is meant to capture longer time periods that the scale <clears throat> to complex actions and cognitive processes that may involve recollection, planning, intention, formation, and so on. Processes occurring on the narrative scale do so after three seconds, more or less, hypothetically, could last much longer. So in this way, cognitive processes are distributed across different timescales and are constituted in a temporarily integrated dynamical system. So <clears throat> through the integration and synchronization, of this case is that the perception of affordances are almost momentarily. There are aggregate forms that are impossible to comprehend but become complete sensory motor schemes in the one 
neuronal processes are integrated with at the neurophysiological level involves the integration of acts all through the body. Phenomenologically, the integrative scale corresponds to the experience living present, the umbelt we just talked before, the level of a fully constituted cognitive operation. Motorically, it corresponds to a basic action. And as we saw, it can also be characterized by the rib structure of the Husserlian placenta. Furthermore, from the inactive and ecological perspective, perception of affordances is temporarily extended. This is because that differences in temporal scales are constitutive of sensory motor and active dynamics, and sensory motor and active dynamics are constitutive of the perception of affordances. Hence, perception of affordances is intri intrinsically temporal. And the threefold distinction made by Varela is helpful for thinking how the two approaches can fit together. Thus, perception of affordances is constituted by the integration of the two first scales, and the experience of it has a rib structure. The time to complete the perception of affordances is not dependent on a fixed integration period as measured by a clock, but it is, in, it is dependent dynamically on the number and the arrangement of cells assemblies that are contributing at the same time in relation with affordances that the subject is interacting with in a given coordination with the environment. That is why the integration scale is flexible depending on the number of elements in the context and also with the corporeal stage and age, previous experiences, among other things. So, summarizing until now, we can say that perception of affordances is constituted by the abilities and characteristics of the environment as relations that occur with an intrinsic temporality that is related to different temporal scales interconnected between them. This constitution is important because perception of affordances is then temporarily extended and, there, and therefore can be characterized by, by the threefold structure proposed by Varela. The two first scales are constitutive of the perception of affordances whenever they get actualized and therefore whenever they bear an umwelt, an experience, for the agent. But what about the third scale? The scale? We will now go into it and with this I will finish. Um, <clears throat> Camero rightly notes uh, that uh, affordances 2.0 were actually intended to provide a way of talking about affordances while acknowledging the fact that individuals organisms learn. And here's a quotation that I'm going to skip because of the time. So here we are introducing learning of affordances, which go in the third temporal scale, the narrative one. In the temporal explanation we are proposing. So I want to maintain that perception or perceptual experience occurs at the integrative scale and what goes on in the narrative scale is different from perception, it is learning. This goes in line with Jacobs and Michael 2007 paper proposal that there is a short time scale of perceiving and acting and a longer time scale for learning. What we, pro what we propose is the narrative scale in this three threefold distinction proposed by Varela to acknowledge that. So at this narrative scale, the affordances are seen as potentialities in the habitat, dispositions, in particular niches, and become umbels when they are actually perceived. There is a lot to say about learning, of course, but that will be material for another talk, I hope. <laughs> For the present purposes, perceptual learning can be defined as involving the increased ability to detect relevant affordances as a result of novel experience, as action cap cap capabilities change, and thereby affordances themselves change. As I can see, these temporal scales can be a useful toolkit for explaining the perception and learning of affordances, and at the same time unifying an activism and ecological psychology claiming that affordances serve a different explanatory role depending on which time scale you consider them at. So if you are interested in explaining the embodied assemblies that form the always changing sensory motor contingencies, then you see the elementary scale. If you are interested in explaining perception at the integrative scale, then affordances are solicitations. If you are interested in explaining change in the animal environment system over developmental time, that's learning time, 
Then affordances are around what Camero said they were when he proposed affordances 2.0, and one should see at the narrative scale. But it is important to say that these three scales are always intertwined because learning and perception are ongoing processes that in many senses are impossible to separate. So concluding, <clears throat> ecological psychologists can explain how the detection of perceptual information leads to the perception of particular affordances at the integrative scale, while the inactivist theory of sensory motor agency can explain how an individual selects among perceived affordances in an embodied and situated way according to her past experiences and learnings as a body environment system, combining the elementary and the narrative scales. So as Bax and Chemero say, the ecological account of external structure is compatible with the activist account of the internal organization of the animal. Life happens in the dialectical confrontation of the two. In radical embodied science cognition uh, needs to be understood in terms of the organism environment system. So on a dynamical systems interpretation, neuronal level events on the form aggregates agencies that manifest themselves as incompressible but acts on the integrative scale, which is the solicit. The narrative scale is to capture longer that scale to complex actions and cognitive processes that may involve recollection, planning, intention formation, learning. And to be understood in narrative one. So our scales matter because affordances have different depending on which scale you consider them at. <clears throat> on, on the notion of synchronic constitution, personal elementary scale neuronal processes constitute Okay, um, I don't know whether that was absolutely terrible timing or um, somewhat fortuitous timing. Um, so we seem to, uh, Melina's connection seems to have just broken. Um, I hope she'll be able to rejoin us fairly quickly. Uh, I would imagine that she, she might, may well be able to do so. I was having great difficulty with the audio through that. I, I got about half it maybe. Okay, um, the audio was a little bit clearer for me, all right. So I would, I would hope um, that it, I guess the, the general points um, will have come across. So what we might do, um, if Fred, if you're happy enough to address um, sort of a couple of things, I might throw a few things at you that um, came out of the talk for me. We might have a little bit of a discussion and that might give Melina a minute or two to rejoin um, and then, uh, with um, sort of, if unfortunately, if, if she's not able to, then what we'll do is, I guess, shift things to the ENSO seminars webpage where uh, we will be able to have a, there'll be a, the, the discussion there or the opportunity for discussion there as, as ever. Um, so I thought, I mean, the issue of timescales is one that, that's come up for me quite a lot. Um, and I, it's sort of very nice to see. Um, that I'm not crazy, that other people are thinking um, along the same lines. And Melina's drawn together a wide, a sort of a number of different literatures in order to, to address it. Aha! Hello. She's back. You're, you're, um, welcome back. Are you back? <laughs> oh, it fell, so I didn't notice. Yes, you, you, you vanished. <laughs> where, okay. where, where did I? Well, just, I think, literally on the concluding um, paragraph of, or almost literally on your on, on your concluding paragraph there. So, um, you you were, in, you, you were okay. summing up on bags and chimero, um, and had moved to just um, reaffirm the the three principle, the the three concepts of affordance that follow at the three different time scales, um, and the the manner in which they are. Um, so the, I think the last thing, or one of the, the, the last things you were talking about before you disappeared was the, um, uh, that life occurs in the, the interaction between, um, 
the internal organization of the agent and the the external uh, okay organization of the environment that that quotation from Chimero and by okay uh, so sh should I just put the conclusion the the conclusion slides um it's I guess it's kind of up to yourself if is there a was there a final slide that you want to make sure that we see and no I think I've made if, if, if it's there where I stop I think there is the 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 important part is the explanatory role of affordances through temporal scales in order to bridge together ecological psychology and, and activism. So if that got clear, I think we can we can go to the questions if you if you like. I don't know. Um yeah no I think that's probably a good place and, and I guess other things might come out through the conversation which will be a um a benefit too. So I guess those kind of um I, I was just um killing a little bit of time there with Brett, just identifying that um this is this is an issue actually that I think a lot of people need to pay more attention to, and I was delighted to see you doing that and to uh, I'm bringing together a number of different sort of points of literature from inactive the kind of couple of different inactive and, and embodied traditions and the, um, the ecological psychology approach. Um, I guess I do have I I have a um, I'll start with maybe with a, a kind of a a bit of a poser I suppose, which is just that um, the something that struck me when you were speaking about the, dis the the distinction later on in the talk between habitats and umbelts um is there um but essentially to a certain extent they may occur on different time scales um but also it struck me that there is in fact two concept of of temporal scale there um and i'm wondering um how to unpick them a little bit one is that um, for something to occur over a longer time scale, it might be that it lasts, which means that it, it sort of it, um, it happens and then it hangs around. Um, mm -hmm. And it might also be that it just takes a long time. So um, it's, it's just a slow drawn out process. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, um, is that a sensible distinction or is in fact lasting it just always is a slow drawn out process or uh, so or was it kind of I, I wondered whether um habitats are just umbels that last um yeah uh, as i see it uh, you, you can have both of the things and there's where the narrative scale comes in because when when things last no uh, for more time um, according to Varela's threefold distinction, uh, you, the, the integration scale can just go up to three seconds, no? And maybe you can think about it a little bit more, no? Maybe four or five seconds in the way that you, you are doing something in the environment, no? For example, um, for example, playing a melody, no? In a guitar. So, um, if you are doing that or, or doing a choreography piece, no, you are you are mixing a lot of affordances there. So that that's that that's uh, uh, one point that I haven't put in together in that. But I I want to say that you have to talk about synergies there, no? because with synergies you would have a lot of the a lot of the variables. Uh, t take taken into account at this big temporal scale happening, but then inside you will have many affordances connecting at the same time in the integrative scales that are happening also in that same time, and the synergy acts as as constraints as con constraint for that action to happen. So this is why the three scales are always intertwined in complex actions, no? because when you take something very easy as taking the pencil, then the act is complete very quickly. But then you have uh, complete actions that need a lot of affordances that are interwined in this complex dynamical system, but always also mixing the learning part and the constraints of the environment for that particular action. I don't know if I, I'm, I'm clear. Yeah, no, I think that's raising, uh, that's answering another question I had actually, which is good, uh, although um, possibly um, 
raising another. So the the way that part of the way that you described it, and again, um, I'm uh, just there was one slide where your audio really got very choppy for me, so it became quite a little bit hard to follow. So I might just have missed this um, in in some of the way it broke up. Um, but it felt a little bit to me there, there's a kind of an internalism which is somewhat ironic given the the origin of the the kind of point of view um, in Varela's work. But it's quite a, there's a quite an internalist narrative here in the way that the time scales work. Um, mm -hmm. That these are these are sort of brain scales. Um, and so there's a, a kind of a, a, I wonder if there's a, um, a sort of a more extensive um, story to tell about how the, um, the, the ecological intrinsic dynamics, as it were, play a role. But you kind of, you've already you've sort of started to address that a little bit because it, it felt, I guess, um, the, the simple description of the elementary integrative and narrative scales felt kind of all very bottom up. Um, but in fact, what you've just described there was very much not bottom up. That there is a the the, the bigger time scales also constrain the smaller ones. Exactly. So it becomes a. We'll see if she uh, streaming is on. <laughs> there it is. Okay. So I have, so, though, bizarrely, I, I, I have. Um, there we go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, for your patience, particularly you, Melina. Um, and also, I will. This is one I think I'm going to. I, I should probably go in and edit most of these videos, but I think uh, this one we'll have to chop up a little bit. Uh, in order to make it a little bit more coherent for people. <laughs> so um, again, just to return with the, the delightful pressures on the internet, get off Netflix, everybody. Uh, <laughs> give, give us some space. The, um, so Melina, again, so Ezekiel's question is, uh, one thing that wasn't very clear to me is whether you are looking into the temporality of affordances as such, or the place of affordances in understanding the temporality of perception. Um, or are these different things for you? <clears throat> yeah, th thanks for the question, Ezekiel. Actually, I think uh, it's a it's a very oh. not, not affordances as such, but the perception of affordances. So, yeah, um, yeah, okay. Uh, so, so what what I'm describing is the temporalities. Of, or of the temporal scales of the perception of affordances, not of affordances as such. And, and this is important for me because I had that uh, problem in the, in the beginning, and then I realized that it can't be of affordances themselves because then, then it wouldn't really make sense. Because if we talk about the perception of affordances, then we can talk of this, the integration of the two first scales for it, and then, we can also talk about learning of affordances in the narrative scales. So it is through affordances that we take the environment, uh, animal system all together, and the time scales serve as an explanatory role in each of the temporal scales of what is happening when we perceive affordances or we engage with affordances, but not as the object affordance itself. Um, I guess I wonder, though, to follow up. Then, are there there will be? I guess affordances do have a an intrinsic temporality of their of their own, which will probably play a role here, though, right? So, um, if we think of one of the classic examples of catching a, a fly ball, a, a ball is only catchable while it's in the air. 
Um, so there is a, you know, there's a very clear temporality to that affordance or even picking up a mug. Um, I can only do so during the period of time when it's sat on the table in front of me and not when it's in the dishwasher um, with the, the door closed and so on. So there is nevertheless still a, for most um, affordances, also a temporality, which is feeding into that mix a bit. Exactly. Yeah, the thing is here is that as, as in ecological psychology and in activism, action and perception are in the same loop all the time. No, yeah. you, 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 you perceive and then act, no? So and act and perceive all the time in a loop. So by engaging, maybe the term would be to engage with affordances, which includes perceive and act, no? You will have an intrinsic temporality. And then, and that intrinsic temporality actually can change uh, when you when you get habits on the going. No, when you become skilled at the performance of certain affordances, that intrinsic temporality changes. No, it's not the same the first time a, a baby grabs a mug that than how I do it. No. The first times are very clumsy and the intrinsic temporality is very long because you don't have the sensory motor scheme and so on. And as you make the habit out of it, the intrinsic temporality shortens a lot. No? So, yeah. Well, yes, thank, thanks for that then. So, um, Fred, did, um, would you like to? Yeah, I, I, thank you very much. It was a very very rich talk <laughs> there was um, so much in there and it, I, i'm afraid the audio was at times rather poor for me so i may have missed a lot and um but I, there, there's a lot of there's an awful lot of there I would, I, that's worth pursuing but um the division between the elementary integrative and narrative time scales i think on your first slide you attributed it to gallagher and later on you seem to attribute it to varela and it's different from husso's presents site right those three jump out at me as being the three time scales that were have been identified in the psychophysics of temporal interval estimation of time perception in the classic work of Paul Fraes. Um, so psychologists have been using these quite a lot and they've developed a lot of um, methods for uh, experimentally constructing, as it were, these this division. So below about 0 0.5, you, things start to become indistinct. They're very, very clearly distinct and sort of one perceives them all at once up to about three seconds and beyond that for certain kinds of given tasks. You have to make use of your fingers or counting or something like that. And so you've entered the narrative mode. I wonder to what extent Varela was drawn by this peculiarly constructive psychological work. I, I don't know if that was the case, but it's always troubled me and I, I, I don't buy it. I think there's lots of reasons to identify all kinds of timescales, but this is a little bit too neat for me. And I'm particularly worried by the narrative timescale. And I found, I, I hope you're still there. Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I found the graphic that you use for the narrative timescale quite illuminating because you used one of those photographic series from Edward Moybridge's classic work of, of uh, Humans in Motion. Yeah. And um, we are, of course, trained in our imagination to, to think about what's going on. We are trained now imagistically. We are trained in terms of a particular um, volumetric representation of space. And photography and motion photography have done an awful lot to encourage us to think of a sort of a mise-en-scene way that things unfold. That's also how we tell stories, usually, by and large, except for the interior bits. We say John was there and Billy was there and they wrote in and they did things with no particular perspective implied. So the narrative scale seems to me to take a big leap out of <laughs> the embodied reality that so characterized your treatment of the Umwelt and possibly cellular processes. Um, so then, sorry, there, there, there's too much there. Relationship to the classic studies in psychology of time and this particular representational problem of the narrative uh, time scale are two things that love to hear your comment on yeah um well the the, the just just to clarify yeah the, the first the first uh, one who took it in this embodied cognitive science was varela and then gallagher took it again and actually has a work with varela no at, at some point um 
and then actually I, I met Gallagher and, and he introduced me to these ideas when 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 I talked to him at some point. Um, so yeah, Var Varela was was thinking about uh, actually taking phenomenology into the uh, conception of how we understand time consciousness. And he was following up Husserl and also the psychologists who were who wanting who were who were desiring to understand was what was time consciousness in this really metaphysical difficult sense of it and so he wanted it to bring it into science and so he developed the new neuro phenomenology which he which he called and then he said that he wanted to use this threefold distinction in order to use only the internal part of the of the phenomenology of experience of time consciousness so he he wanted to say and actually just to say this i started my phd dissertation with this question how how, how could we characterize temporal experience no in the in the in the classical psychology sense but then i took it apart because it was too complicated and then I just wanted to, I, I just uh, stayed with the, with the, with the cognition part, the action, no? the action, yes, in the agent part. For me, that there's, there's a friction here because that sense in which any psychologist, Paul Fraze and anyone working in that vein, would, you, would speak of the perception of time or of something like temporal experience, there's little or no relation to the way that those words are used in Husserlian phenomenology or in an act of cognitive science or in Varela's work. They're, 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 they're really poles apart as far as I can see. I wonder though, is there some cross, I won't say pollination, yeah. that sounds too positive, cross pollution going on here. <laughs> yeah, I, well, what I, what I try to do or what I want to do is to use also Merleau-Ponty a lot in his re in how he understands Husserl in the way that experience is all the way happening with the interaction with the world and that is where an active and ecological psychology come in because when you take the 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 experience all, all of experiences as perception themselves of the agent environment system then you can say that you can explain how experience happens in this in this way not talking about the agent environment system as a unit of analysis and not just what is happening inside the brain or what is just happening in the uh, internal voice phenomenology type of explanation but how experience in itself is happening so i think for that you can use the threefold uh, distinction of scales because that explains how actually perception of affordances can happen at different points in the uh, in the way it happens and then with the learning processes of the narrative because you don't live in an eternal present no you go accumulating memories and learning new things and experiencing new things that also get into the stream or flow of experience so i think maybe it's not there yet i i, I can say that for sure but i think it's a good way to get into the proper phenomenology within radical embodied cognitive science, no? which I think it's a desirable project, at least. No? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, that, that, um, that's great. No, that, um, that's kind of a nice encompassing point, I think, on which to finish. I'm just realizing that um, we're approaching the hour mark and um, <laughs> this is probably a, a sort of a, a nice, avenue to the future that it's um worth probably a, a good point to finish up on so i will um i'll just say thank you very much uh, melina for yeah. uh, a sort of fruitful really engaging and um and, and rich talk and uh to remind people again that the the conversation can continue on the the discussion forum for this seminar this particular seminar on the ensoseminars.com website so um Thanks again, uh, Melina, and we will see everyone in a month's time for uh, our, our next ENSO seminar. Okay, thank you very, very much for, for being here and inviting me. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, so we are... <laughs>